Hey, Jim Bergman with MeasureQuick. I wanted to show you a new diagnostic we built into MeasureQuick. One of our customers called the other day and had, uh, had a restricted suction line, and they're like, uh, the software didn't pick it up. They were sort of surprised we didn't have that diagnostic built in, and to be honest, I was too. I didn't, it's not a, a condition that we run across all the time. But in you know, like new construction, when the equipment starts to settle, um, maybe you know it, it gets kinked off or something, and it's actually a pretty challenging one to pick up. So what I did here is, in the suction line, I actually installed a, uh, a ball valve so we could throttle this down and create a restriction in the suction line. You can see right now I got the system up and running, superheat spot on, subcooling looks good. Uh, if we scroll through a little bit, supply return air temperatures look good, uh, capacity's right in range, and our, we're running about a 13 sear on a 13 sear system. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start to close this valve off a little bit so you can see what some of the effects are on it. Now, I also installed a second uh, clamp here for just a minute, and I do want to show you something on that clamp real quick, and let me just highlight this. Now, this is my discharge line temperature clamp, so if we scroll up here a little bit, you can see my suction line is uh, about 65 degrees, and then down here I'm about 65 degrees also, so there's, it's actually 64.6, but that's probably just a little bit of a, uh, uh, the difference in the two readings are probably about the same. So there's no temperature difference really between this clamp and this clamp here on my suction line. They're, they're pretty much identical on there. Um, and so th that's the way it should be. In fact, it should actually get warmer from this point to this point because there's additional superheat that's gained in this suction line. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start throttling this down here for just a minute. And I'm gonna take it a good part of the way because it's really not gonna make much difference at first. Um, and I'm throttling it down just to where I can start to hear a little bit of a difference. So the first thing you're gonna notice here, let me go back here, and we will just close up the toolbox for a minute, is that our subcooling, and I'll go to the trend here just so you can see it on the trend here. As soon as we started closing off that valve there, our superheat went up initially, and then it's starting to come back down again, and our subcooling is trending here in a slightly downward direction. So we're about 8384 and it's starting to trend downward a little bit. I'm gonna turn it just a little bit further shut. And what's interesting here is, um, I can just now hear it, but you're gonna see this, this trend keep repeating here. Now, the question is, is well, what's going on in the system? So let me just go back here to the, uh, to the home page, and we'll go back to superheat and subcooling. So right now what's happening is, is as I throttle this down, Right, the suction pressure on this side of the system is starting to uh, really, well, in fact, here you can see it's not changing at all. We have no change in suction pressure here, but we are seeing to see our sub our subcooling drop, and that's because overall, we're continuing to feed the same amount of liquid into the coil there, but we're not quite pulling the mass flow back the same. So even though the pressure's still up a little bit, we're not pulling the refrigerant back at the same rate, and it's actually stacking up inside of that evaporator coil. It's almost acting like a second, conden uh, second condenser. And what's gonna happen over time is, is as we stack more and more liquid in here, that that is actually gonna become a secondary condenser in some respects. So we're gonna start to lose uh, temperature drop across the coil, and we'll start to see some other things change. But right now you can see our superheat still looks good. Subcooling still uh, is down a little bit, but pressures are still fine. And you can start to hear this a little bit. I'll move this down so you can hear this in just a second here. I'm gonna throttle it down a little bit more. And I'm gonna move my mic down here for just a minute so you can hear this sound. You can sort of hear there's a hissing sound in the suction line now. And that hissing sound is due to the refrigerant that is slightly restricted as it's going through that metering device. Well, not a metering device, but through that ball valve, which is quickly becoming another metering device. So you can see now, subcooling still continues to drop, superheat looks good, suction pressure dropped a little bit on there. And I'm gonna clear out our diagnostics here so we can start to see what's going on here. But overall, you see it's really no system-wide faults. So even though we have a, a, a restricted down to the point where you can hear the restriction, it's really not impacting the operation of the machine that much. Let's go here and let's take a flip through some of the graphics and see what's going on. So you can see our subcooling continuing to drop. Superheat went up a little bit, it's starting to drop off. And then we'll look at our, our suction temperature is the red line here is starting to come down. Liquid temperature is starting to rise up a little bit. Our return and supply air temp pretty much stayed ex exactly the same. Our temperature split uh, maybe is rising just a hair, but it looks pretty stable. And our total capacity now 
is uh, if anything looks like it's, it's going up just a tiny bit. And then we'll go back here to EER and SEER. So um, we'll take a peek here. We'll just go back this way and we'll go to electrical and SEER. So our SEER is still right at that 13.0 range. So we'll throttle this down a little bit more to the point where we can start to see our suction pressure drop a little bit below the line here. All right, so now the restriction is pretty severe. You can see where, where my wrench is positioned here. Obviously, this is straight on. So this is, you know, we're, we're a good part of the way closed here. But now I'm starting to get a drop in suction pressure, and I'm starting to get uh, a lower sear value on here. And let's take a look at our superheat and subcooling for a second. Subcooling is dropping because, again, we're starting to stack liquid up in the evaporator coil. So it's building up liquid there, which means we're robbing it from the condenser. Superheat's still about the same. Now, you got to wonder why is that superheat running about the same? Because if you notice, our suction line temperature here started to drop. And let's go back into that toolbox for just a minute here. So I'm going to click in the toolbox. And we'll go into the toolbox. We'll go back to the probe manager and we'll look at that suction line again. So now our suction line leaving the evaporator coils at 60 degrees. But look at our temperature of our suction line entering the condenser now is at 53 degrees. So basically what we're doing now is we're stacking liquid. That whole coil is full of liquid. And now this suction line has essentially become a little piece of liquid line. And this is now a secondary metering device. And so what's happening is, is we're actually dropping that pressure far enough now that we're getting a temperature drop on this line. So that's why we have a suction line temperature of 51 entering the condenser and 57 entering the discharge, uh, you know, exiting the evaporator coil. So let's go back here for just a minute. I'll hit back here and we'll close this up. Now, the software at this point is picked up. There's a kink of restriction in the suction line. And it's picked it up because we have a lower than normal suction line temperature. And that's due to this restriction right here. We have lower than normal superheat because this line is getting so cold. And so even though our pressure is still up, our suction line temperature dropped down dramatically at this point. And then we have low subcooling because we're stacking the liquid that would normally be in the condenser. Now is stacking in the evaporator coil. Our liquid line temperature is normal. Our head pressure is normal. And in a lot of cases, a lot of guys would try and add additional refrigerant to this. And there's a couple key indicators here again. I want you to listen. You can hear the noise of this. You can hear the, the hissing sound. So it's a really good indicator that the suction line is, is uh, kinked. We got a low suction line, lower than normal suction line temperature. And obviously we have the diagnostics. If you click on the diagnostics, it'll tell you the measurement indicates a kink or restriction of suction line. Using two probes, measure the temperature difference between the evaporator outlet and the condenser inlet and verify that the temperature is hotter at the, at the condenser inlet here at the condenser inlet than it is as it, uh, at the evaporator outlet. And in this case here, we have a drop in temperature, which I showed you on those probes, which indicates we have a kink suction line on here. So pretty cool stuff here. Um, it allows us to uh, very quickly assess the system. And this is a problem that otherwise might be a little tricky to find. Hope you guys got a little bit out of this video and enjoyed it. It was a sort of a fun little project to do. And it, I actually learned some things myself sometimes doing this because I would have thought um, specifically the, uh, the, the head pressure and the, and the subcooling would have gone a little bit different direction. But this is sometimes the only way you actually find these things out is by actually doing the real testing. This is Jim Bergman with MeasureQuick. Thanks a lot for watching. One thing that you really need to watch if you're going to do this in a classroom, by the way, is when you open up this valve back up, you can see my suction pressure is low, my suction temperature is low, my superheat's running about nine degrees right here. If I open up this valve, what's going to happen is I have a full column of liquid here now behind this. And if I open this up really fast, I'm going to flood my compressor. And you'll see here, it's just as I open this up, if you watch my superheat, you're going to see the superheat tank here. It might be easiest to watch it on the graph here. So we'll look at the, you can see the superheat's coming up here, but I'm going to just cr start cracking this open. And you're going to see here, that superheat plummeted right there. So it went down really, really fast. And that's because we pushed a large glob of liquid through to the compressor there. So you wanna make sure you're doing this slowly so you don't damage that compressor. We'll go back here to superheat here and uh, see this. So we can see it's 7.3 and it's slowly coming back up. So don't open this up quickly, just crack it a tiny bit at a time and you'll see it. Make sure that superheat doesn't go down towards zero. And then once you get it to where it's, you can hear the noise go away, 
you're probably safe to open it wide open and let it go. But watch uh, initially, you don't want to crack that valve wide open or you're going to have a whole evaporator full of liquid fill up your compressor and you could, you could uh, damage your compressor or wash all the oil out and cause some other issues.